at it. I'm still changing. I'm still being transformed. God is still dealing with me. Every day he's dealing with me. Good morning again, church. Good morning, everybody online. How great is it to know that no matter what we go through in life, whatever gets thrown at us, whatever gets um, stacked on top of us, that there is power in the name of Jesus to get us through it. That we just call on that name and the weight is lifted. Because he said it himself, bring your sins to me. Let me deal with it. And I will, and trust in me and I will get you through it. So. Let's jump into the IOC news for this week. Um, Mondays, we have our prayer meeting at 8 p.m. through Zoom. If you go on IOC.live, you can see the link to click on that, and that'll get you in. And, you know, every week now it's getting more and more powerful that we're beginning to open up and just pray for, for all the situations that's going on around this world, around in our lives, you know, throughout our city. And, you know, I see breakthrough happening through people. When we, when we open up and we just, you know, send our requests up to God and let God, you know, process it the way he does. And then on Wednesday nights at 7.30 p.m. through Zoom, we have our awesome Bible study that's brought by Pastor David on the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter 2, and we left off on verse 14. And, you know, it's just so amazing to see how people are digging deep to, to really study this word and to be able to teach it as well. You know, Pastor David is helping us to, to bring out, you know, our gifts out of us that we could be able to present the word and really understand it and bring it for what it says. And, and then we have also, um, we've been talking about inviting people for Resurrection Sunday. And, you know, we've been praying for, for everybody for the past two months, two, three months now. And, you know, we just want to be able to connect with them live and be here and bring them in for the you know, the, um, that fellowship and, and, you know, the worship time that we could spend together and just help them to see that God really want, loves them and really wants them to be a part of this community, you know, it, and it helps them to, to break out of whatever they're in and receive that great breakthrough, you know, that, that's inside of them. So we encourage everybody to, um, if you want to get the link to be able to share it, we can um, all go to Nicole and she could send it out to us, and we could be able to share it through whatever social platform you use, Facebook, Instagram, Tweet, um, and, and email to, uh, oh yeah, and Pastor says it's also been emailed to, to everybody that's on the list that we have. So if you're not on that list, please get with Pastor David so that, and give him your email, so that way he can be able to include you in everything that we do here. Um, let's pray for the tithes and offerings. Lord, Father God, I just thank you for all that you do, Father God, in this ministry, Lord. I thank you for opening up doors, Father God, in our lives, Father God, through, through the youth, through the children, through the men's, the women's ministries, Father God, that, that we provide here, Lord, and that we, get, we just ask you, Father God, to continue to pour into us, Lord. And we just thank you for all that you do. Bless those who can give, Father God, and those who can't give, Father God, that you make a way for them, Father God, that the next time that they could be able to give out of their abundance. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome Pastor David for today's word. Amen. Let's all stand for a second. Got to get that blood flowing up and down, up and down. Praise God. Take someone by the hands. 
Praise God. And let's come in agreement. Say, Father, I come here in Jesus' name that you could have your way in my life. I have ears to hear what your Holy Spirit says to me. Amen. Praise God. Social gospel versus God's gospel. And here's the reason why I'm talking about the social gospel versus God's gospel. Because we're living in an age now that in many ways... People think they know the gospel, but they really actually don't know the gospel. What they know is a social gospel. Thank God for people who do know the gospel. Thank God for people who actually have been studying the word of God, learning as much as they can in order for them to have a better understanding of who God is in their lives. You got to know who you are. You got to know who you are in Christ in order for you to grow, in order for you to get that place of knowing that God is showing you this or that. So let's go. Uh, I didn't even open up. Here it goes. Okay. A couple of weeks uh, week ago, I spoke about something I want to bring up again. A belief pattern that does not match a biblical pattern. Feelings that justify their action. A head knowledge that fits in with their social life. This is a social gospel right there. It's about feelings. It's about what they're going through. It's about their own knowledge, not God's word. Not, not the knowledge that comes from the word of God but the knowledge that comes from their surrounding, what's taking place, what people are telling them, what people are speaking into them. And this is why we need to know that there is a difference between the social gospel that we have in this world today, especially in this country, in comparison to God's gospel. In Matthew 21, verse 28 to 32, it says, But what do you think? A man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I'll go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? They said to him, The first. Jesus said to him, to them, Surely I say to you that tax collectors, harlots, enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors, harlots, believe him. And when you saw it, you did not afterwards, re- or afterward relent and believe him. There's a way to discern between a social gospel and God's gospel and it's by their fruits, which I should have said this earlier. But there is a way. Fruits. The fruits that's in your life. Bring the mic a little bit lower. The fruits that's in your life determines where you stand. Is it a social gospel that you're believing in? Or is it a gospel from the Word of God itself? You cannot judge anyone. You see, fruits are different. Fruits is your action. Fruits is how you live. Fruits is what's inside of you that's being manifest on the, other, on the outside that others could see. Judging someone, say, well, I know you're going to hell, then that's wrong of us because we're nobody. We're not God to judge anyone. Only God can do that and no one else can. Amen? Say amen. Man, I heard the amen louder from the streamers than you guys. I said, say Amen. It is not our job to judge anyone's eternity. It is our job to inspect fruits. The Bible says you will know them by their fruits. That's a warning for us. What God is trying to tell us, listen, if you want to really know more or less what's really taking place, because only God knows the heart of every single human being that exists, is look at their fruits. What type of fruits do they have in their lives? And the reason why God tells us to look at their fruits is so that we could be careful with who we're hanging around with. Just because they say they're Christian means nothing. doesn't mean they're safe. Amen? That Anyone could say, I believe in God. doesn't make them safe. Anyone could say, well, I, I believe there's a higher power. I believe there's Jesus that existed and that he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. So I believe in something. Okay, it's not believing in something. It's actually having a relationship with someone. Too many people are believing in something with no relationship with the someone which gives salvation, which is Jesus Christ. So this is a social gospel. The social gospel is willing to believe in something, 
but not have a relationship with someone. And that's what we got to be careful with, and that's how we have to talk about their fruits. So here Jesus is giving a parable to his disciples and to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawyers, the people that were there, the people that were around him. They were both believers and non-believers around him. And look what he's saying here. He goes, listen, which one did the will of the Father? I want you guys to understand this part here. He's talking about the house of God. <clears throat> Sorry. He is speaking about the house of God. He's saying, well, Father came and he told his sons, two sons, do this. Oh, do it, Dad. I'm in. Don't worry about it. He never does it. Then he speaks about the other son. He goes, son, can you do this? I'm not going to do anything. But yet he does it. And then he compares the house of God to what's taking place around him and by speaking to those who are around him at this time. And he's asking them, which one did right? And yet he says, it'll be easier. And this is the crazy part. This is the part that you're, you're, they, they must have freaked out when they said, when they heard this from Jesus. We're talking about these religious leaders, these people who are supposed to be teaching people right from wrong according to the law, according to, amen, what God has said. He's saying this to them. And he's asking them, which one? But then he says, for John, meaning John the Baptist, came and he spoke about righteousness, and you didn't even believe him. But yet, the tax collectors, the harlots, they believe. Then why is it that when afterwards you saw this happen, did you not believe? Seeing that something is happening. How we live are the fruits of what we believe. Folks, how you live are the fruits of what you believe. So in other words, if you're not really believing, then you have no fruits. You don't have the fruits of what God calls the fruits of righteousness. The Bible is showing us specifically that we need, if we say that we believe, we're going to show it somehow, right? Have you ever noticed in the world that if you go to a hospital, all the doctors usually are, for the most part, dressed the same? A white coat, right? I have a different shirt underneath, but it's always that nice white jacket with their name on it, Dr. So-and-so. Notice that a nurse doesn't wear that. Who wears that again? A doctor wears that. Now, a nurse, when you go to the hospital, you can identify them because they also, especially more now than ever before, everyone has a code of colors based upon position in the hospital. Go to any hospital now, and they all got the transporters, the one that transport people from bed to bed or from place to place, they have a, the same color. The nurse have the same color. Everyone that does something, they always have a color to identify who they are, not just their tag. Because in an emergency and you're in the hospital, you don't have time to be looking at everyone's side. Hold on, let me look at your tag. Or you're like me, you're not wearing your glasses, and the next thing you know, you need it for reading. I, I can't stop and say, okay, hold on. They made it easier. Identify them by colors, by the clothes they're wearing. Are you with me so far? If you go to a police station, for the most part, everyone's wearing what? The same colors. Unless they're a detective. Unless they're something in a, in a, in a special field that no one's supposed to know about, or at least the criminals are not allowed to know about, right? But they're wearing colors. You go to the fire department, they're wearing the same clothing. Is that true? Are you guys get, you guys get what I'm trying to say? You go to the zoo, and they all have shorts, shirts with a title on it, with a logo on it. They're wearing something so you can identify who works there and who doesn't work there. Are you with me so far? So, so is with the church of God. 
Now, our thing is not to wear different, or better said, no, we're not all wearing the same colors, right? We're not all dressed identically the same. No. But there's something in us that should identify us, and that is the Spirit within us, the Holy Spirit. You see, when you go to the world, when, in other words, when you go out, there could be people who are dressed this way, dressed that way, but there's something about certain people, you look at them, and you're like, whoa, okay. Uh, I don't know who this person is, but I look in their eyes, I see darkness. Has ever, anyone ever seen that before? You look in someone's eyes, and you're like, doo, 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 doo. your mind is thinking like, whoa, there's something. But then you see other people, you don't know from Adam, and then all of a sudden you see a light coming out of their eyes. There's a glow upon them. There's something that's different that you're not sure what it is, but it's telling you that person is different. I remember a long time ago, we were witnessing in the streets, uh, and it was in the Grove, and at that time, the Grove was set up in a, a little bit different than now, but it was set up in a way where they were allow card readers, palm readers, to actually have a table out in the street. Yeah, right there, a little table, a little tiny table, that's it. And they would be standing there, you know, trying to get people to come to the little table so they could read your palm, so they could read the cards for you, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And we will be witnessing and, and talking to people, and we will walk around. We will not stay in one spot. We will always walk around, pass out tracks, and talk to individuals. Ask them to, so we don't just give a track. We gave the track with the actual knowledge of why we're there. Jesus came to save you. There's hope. Amen? And here's the thing, but one, remember one time, they didn't, they, this, these, these uh, psychic readers, that had, there was one table that was psychic readers, and they were not, they didn't know us, then we didn't know them. We were just walking by. And I will never forget how one of the psychic readers actually looked at it and goes, I know who you are. I, I thought that they were trying to get our attention to come to the table. You know what I mean? You know how people use certain things? But they looked at us and they said, You're from God. And I'm like, Okay, how she knows that we're saved. That's when we find out she was a psychic reader. That's when we find out what she was trying to get other people and deceive people to follow, follow her way of thinking, which is demonic. But she recognized light. Though we didn't see it among each other. We don't, it's not like I say, hey, I see a light upon you. Hey, hey, wow, you're really bright. You're really bright today. But we're not, we, there's nothing we can see. But darkness, people who actually dabbles in that demonic realm, they know who is a Christian and who's not a Christian. Because they're working for the opposite side. Amen? And what I'm trying to say is fruits and how people look at you. Are people looking at you and seeing you call yourself a Christian? They might not say that you're to your face. But maybe in their jobs, they're talking to other people, and they're saying, that's a Christian? Well, whatever church they're going to, we better not go to that church. Come on, can I hear an amen? This is what happens, folks. Because sometimes, and let me say, I'm not saying that, that those people are not Christians. I'm saying that sometimes that we don't realize the damage that we bring to those around us by what we do, by what we say, in many different ways. Yes, they could be maybe baby Christians that just got saved and they're trying to learn and they still have some, you know, foul mouth, you know, hand signals that, you know, you know what I mean? Sign language, you know? The whole key is that we're to change. The fruits of the Holy Spirit is what's going to change us. It's what's going to give us those fruits, better said. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to change, to have the fruits of the Spirit of God. Relent. Look what they said there. The, the word relent means sorry. To repent because you believe. You see, that's the key right there. You repent because now you believe. Like, whoa, I am so sorry. Man, why did I do that for? Oh, I am so sorry, God. I'm, I'm, I'm messing up, God. Can you help me here a little bit, Lord? I need, I need strength. This is very difficult for me. You're repenting because you believe. If you don't repent, it's because the fact is you probably don't believe. Or you believe in a social gospel. Uh, God already knows I'm going to sin, so, you know, what do I have to remind him for? 
Come on. Well, you know what? God already knows. He knows my heart. He knows everything from, from A to Z. He knows everything from before I was born into the day I die. He knows. Yes, you're right. He knows everything. But God has given us the choice to choose whether we want Him or not. No one is going to be forced to believe in God. You got to choose that. It's a free will choice that you and I have to say, Lord, forgive me. Woe is me, Lord. And that's the thing about salvation, that when you get saved, there's, there's a change that takes place on the inside. Not so much on the outside right away, but it follows quickly. But the change happens inside first. And there's going to be struggles with the changes. There's going to be temptation with the changes. But the good thing is this, changes are in the heart, inside. And then you begin to manifest those changes because now you want to please God. It's no longer about pleasing yourself. It's no longer about pleasing someone else. Your key, your, your goal to life now, Lord, how can I play, please you, the one who saved me from the pit of hell? The one who's given me eternity in heaven. The, the one that gave me everything and anything I could ever ask for from this day forward. And I want to say from this day forward, and I want to tell you why. Because some of you might have gone through some very hard stuff. Amen? Some of you might have gone through some abuse. Some of you might have gone through some bad stuff that you will not want that anyone, not even on your own worst enemy. And what happened in your past is the cause of sin in the world. It's not to blame God. Oh, God, look, you allow this to happen. God gave every human being the choice to do what they want to do and the choice to live the way they want to live. And sometimes because of that, we have suffered because of someone else's choice. But here's the good news. When you come to God, now God gives you that choice to do good to be a blessing to someone, not to bring harm to anyone, but to bring a blessing to someone in your life, to bring a blessing to those people who are around you. In John 15, verse 1 to 8, let's read it. The Bible says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that I may bear more fruit. You are already, now he's talking to the disciples now, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Man, the word cleanses us. The word prunes us. You ever read something in the word and you're like, oh, that hurts. You don't have to hear anybody. You just read something in the word and it's like all of a sudden you feel like, oh my goodness, that was for me, God. Thank you, Lord. But it hurts a little bit, you know? Okay. Then he goes on, abide in me and I in you. Now he's giving us the solution. He's giving us the way. Abide in me and I will abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, and he is cast out as a branch, and is withered, and they gather them, and they throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. Okay, first one. God takes out the branches that has been pruned, but no longer bears fruits. God is talking about the church right there. He's talking to his people. He's saying, listen, everyone has to bear fruit. It doesn't say one fruit, two fruit, three fruits. It's saying much fruit. This makes a difference. In other words, God is not satisfied with what people's social gospels say. I'm doing what I can, and God knows. So you know what? You're going to have to accept me the way I am. Well, God doesn't accept that. 
Because God already gave you something called the Holy Spirit who will help you if you would truly rely on him. And he's telling us here in this scripture alone, there's many scriptures again for this, he's telling us you must bear fruit, much fruit, to glorify the Father. That's how he gets glorified when we're bearing much fruit. The Word keeps you abiding in Jesus to bear fruit. Have a tree in the yard. Looks like it's dying. It's time to find out whether it's dead or not by breaking, breaking a branch. And if that branch that you break has a little green, it's alive. But if it's brown, it's already dead. You cut that piece off to save the rest of the tree. You see, if you don't cut the dying branches in a live tree, you affect the live tree by the dead branches. So you got to cut it off. Sometimes you got to prune it in such a way that it looks like you're cutting almost a whole tree off, but you're not. You're trying to give it a chance to bring life back. And this is the way God is giving us the example for you and I. He said, listen, I want to cut those things. I want to prune you. I want to prune you. I want to cut those things, those, those, those sins, those, all those things that is out of, out of doubts and fears, lack of faith, or everything. Everything that is not pleasing to God, everything that's not pleasing to God. He's going to start cutting it off. But as a vine dresser, he does this little by little. He doesn't cut the whole thing off. He says, I'm going to just prune this, prune here, prune there. Water it, cultivated it to bring life back. But notice that Jesus says that you cannot bear fruit outside of me. And the reason why the social gospel has no fruit because they're not abiding in Christ, and Christ is not in them. They have the knowledge, they have the right Christianese talk, but they don't have the fruit to prove that Christ is abiding in them. Christ wants to abide in us. If Christ abides in us, there is no choice but to bear fruit. There is no working around it. As long as Christ is in you, abiding in you, because you're abiding in him, you will bear fruit. You don't even really have to try that hard, to be honest with you. It just becomes, why? Out of you, because you're bearing fruits based upon your relationship. Okay, let's break it down a little bit here. Amen? Every relationship that's strong, it's a relationship that talks to each other, do things with each other, know each other, sacrifice for each other, and that's what makes our relationship strong. It's that simple. Can we understand that part at least? That's the part that's, because we see it all around us, right? Any friends that you have, you have acquaintance, you have friends, and you have maybe, hopefully, what? A best friend, right? Someone tell me here, what's the difference between your best friend, or let me rephrase it. What is the difference between your acquaintance and your friend? Say it again. The proximity of your relationship. Very simple, right? Your acquaintance and your friend, right? This one acquaintance doesn't get close compared to this friend here. With your friends, you, you go out, you hang out. With your acquaintance, you don't. You might have to sometimes might have to go out because of your job, meaning you have to entertain them, you have to take them out, whatever the reason, but they're not your friend. They're your acquaintance. Your employee, those who you're, you're, you're oh, I forgot the word now. Your fellow employees, co-workers, thank you. That was the word I was looking for. Your co-workers might not necessarily be your friend. They're really your acquaintance, unless you actually hang out with those co-workers on a regular basis. Outside of work, then they're becoming your friends. Now, what's the difference between a friend and a best friend? You might have only one or two. A best friend, your BFF, is only one, right? Why is your... BFF only one and not 10. Why? You what? You're taking the time to have a closer relationship 
with that person. What else? Give me one more thing from that. There's something you do with your, be, with your best friend that you will not do with your friends, your acquaintances, anyone else. Intimacy. You would tell that person things that nobody else knows. You could trust that person. You could tell them everything and anything, and they're still going to be your best friend. You know who are really good best friends? Are the ones that you know from a child. You know them forever. They know your ups and downs in every way possible. You know their ups and downs in every way possible. They know the good side. They know the bad side. They know the ugly side. Because they see you grew up together. Those are usually strong best friends for life because of that reason. A new best friend, they still got to get to know you. You still got to get to know them. Now you have to work on a relationship that's going to take years. A best friend does not happen overnight either, does it? It takes years for it to take place. It, actually, let me rephrase that. It should take years. If you have a best friend for someone you just met, you don't even know what the best friend really means. What you have is just a friend. And then one day that person disappoints you, and you're no longer friends. But if they were truly your best friend, and they disappoint you, you're still friends. Through the thick and the thin, you remain friends no matter what. Because you know each other that well. And if, but it took years, it took time to cultivate that. It didn't happen overnight, folks. What Jesus is saying to us it's not going to happen overnight with us. We get saved overnight. Yeah, that, have, that does happen. Thank God for that. Amen. We don't have to work for it. It does. It's just, boom, it happens as soon as we believe in our hearts. And with a sincere heart, immediately we feel change taking place in us. But during that change, during that relationship, he's pruning us. He's telling us, hey, ¿qué pasa? What's happening here? And you're like, oh, God, are you sure I can't do that? What's wrong? Well, that person is doing that. What's wrong? Why can't I do this? No, it has nothing to do with that person doing anything anymore. It has to do with God telling you. That's all that is. God telling you. God wants you to follow him for him. You don't follow him because everyone else follows him, and you want to follow him the way they follow him. You follow him out of a pure relationship. So he says, I am the vine. Without me, you cannot bear any fruit. Notice that it said that in the scripture. You can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. That's verse 5. Verse 5 is saying, if you truly have a God gospel, and really you can't do anything unless you're abiding in the vine. If you're abiding in the vine, it means you have to be willing to get pruned. It means a little... Cutting here and there, or that or this. Amen? If you're abiding in him, it means it's his way, not your way. It's his way, not your way. If you're abiding in him, then, like I said earlier, you're automatically going to bear fruits because you are abiding in him. Psalms 92, verse 13 to 14. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall, not maybe, not perhaps, Let's see how the weather is, right? What does it say here? Shall, shall flourish in the courts of our God. Amen? They should bear fruit in old age. They should be fresh and flourishing. Isn't it good? Those who are getting older, or you guys who are getting older. Isn't it good to know? That as we get older, we stay fresh in the kingdom of God. We stay fresh on this earth. Listen, there's people who are young and they're rotting away on the inside. They're dying on the inside. They have no life. They don't even know what life really is. All they know is stress, fears, doubts, and that's all they know. They don't know what peace really means. They, they don't know how to put their phone down for five minutes and just turn it off, turn everything off, and just get some peace from God. They don't know what that is. There's some people, and then you got some older people who've been long enough in the Lord that they, they can tell you, listen, just relax, man. Just relax. Who, you, what do you think you're going to change? Not much. Just relax. 
Just chill. Relax in God. Seek the Lord, and he'll give you the answers. He'll show you the way out. He'll show you what you need. He'll show you what needs to be changed maybe in you. But just relax right now. I just want you to relax. God sometimes is telling us, relax. You see, we're not, unless we're planted in the house of the Lord, we cannot relax. We got to be planted in his house. In order for us to bear the fruits that God wants us to bear, we have to be able to be planted, planted in the house of the Lord. Planted in his house. A social gospel is not planted in the house of God. They have all the right words, but they're not replanted whatsoever. Planted means one place. Planted means one soil. Planted means you're allowing the one, the one that has to prune you, to prune you. <laughs> Even if it hurts. Even if you don't really like it. Or let's put it this way. Especially when you don't agree with it. But because you're planted. You see, I have the choice in my house which tree goes and which tree doesn't go. It's, it's my house. It's my yard, right? This tree's not producing. You're gone, buddy. I'll give you a few more years. That's it. I want to believe that something's going to change in you. I want to pray over you. And believe me, I have prayed for my trees. I have prayed. And things have happened. Some has not happened. And they're not there anymore. It's that simple. Why, why take space when something else could be, take the place of it and produce something at least? You know, God is the same thing with his church. He's saying, listen, if you're not, after I prune you and you can't bear fruits, I'm going to cut you off. And I'm going to throw you into the fire instead. Listen, if you in any shape or form believe that God is all love and nothing else, you have a social gospel. Because God, not only is God all love, but he's also all just. He's both. He's love and he's just at the same time. Sometimes he's passing judgment. Ju just, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes he's got to pass judgment in order to get us to the place that we need to be for our own sake. And sometimes he's giving us love in order to bring us to that place or to keep us there. But he's both. God is not all judgmental and condemning and all this that you, you're going to hell for the slightest thing you do, but God is not all love that you do whatever you want. No, he's both. He's love and he's just. And we need to realize that. And this is where the fruit comes into play. When we see both of that, we see who he is as a loving God, but we also know him as a just God we begin to understand how, what it means to have reverence to the Lord. You know, this could be a, a pet peeve on my, on my part. I'll be honest with you. I'm not saying it is, it is or it isn't, but I'll be honest with you. I just don't like when people, oh, yeah, Jesus, man, you know, God, you know, he's my, he's my homie. He's my, it's like, man, if you, that tells me that you either you don't know God at all or you just got saved and you're an idiot. And you need to repent because you should not talk that way because if, you know who God is. God is not your homie. God is not your buddy. He is God of the universe, the creator of all things. And it's for us to honor him for who he is. There is not one scripture in the Bible that, that makes God look like a buddy. Not one. Not one. Oh, but Jesus, you know, he was friends with the disciples. Jesus is our brother. Now, how do we break that in part? God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit? Listen, I'm not here to tell you that I have all the answer to that, but I know this. You still have to have a reverence for the Holy Spirit, and it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. You still have to have a reverence for Jesus, our Savior, and then you still have to have a reverence for God, the creator of all things. How we break all that apart. Hey, the only way I could come maybe a little close to it, not that it is, but close enough to it, would be very simple. I'm a father. My daughter dare not call me by my first name. I will rebuke them. I will say, well, hello, uh, we have a problem here. Now, they're going to introduce me. Oh, this is my father, David, one thing. 
They call me dad. That's it. That's my title to you. I'm your dad. I'm not your friend. I'm not your buddy. I'm your dad. Today, we have so many people wanting to be friends with their parents, and that's why there is no guidance and direction because a parent is a friend, and this is a friend. And if you treat this friend like this, you eventually are going to treat your parents the same way because you put them on the same level. My parents is here. Then comes my friends. Is that simple. I have to respect my mom and dad. I respect my uncles and aunts. Remember back in the days, you didn't call someone by your, your aunt by her first name or your uncle by their first name. You call them, Theo, 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 Thea. For you white people, uncle, aunt. Am I, am I right or wrong? It's true. Sir, ma'am, you go to the Carolinas. The kids are telling areas, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. It's respect. That's what that is. Respect, pure, simple, easy respect. If we could respect here on this level, how can we not respect and honor God for all the great things he has done for us? If I can respect my parent because they're my parent, how can I respect God? I don't call my parents, oh, this is my, this is my homie, you know, my homie G. I don't do, I don't, uh, no. Now, there's, there's times that we might joke around about, between parents and kids and stuff like that. But listen, the honor is there. The respect is there. The social gospel don't have honor. A social gospel don't have respect. A social gospel talks about other churches like there was no tomorrow. Well, you know what? That's No, listen, don't talk about God's house. Regardless of what they're doing right or wrong, do not talk about that house of God. That's God's judgment on them if God wants to pass judgment. Because the fact is this, someone is talking about our church too, by the way. That's how it is. There's always someone to say something bad about every church that exists in this world. And yet, we never look at it from the inside, what they might be saying about us. But we easily easy might point the finger at another church because of what one person or two people might have done in that church. No, this doesn't work that way. You respect God. You respect the church of God. The house of God has to be respected. That's the way it is. That's the way it should be. That's the way it, the Word shows us that way. Well, but we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Are you really the temple of the Holy Ghost? Let's be honest. How much respect you're showing there? That you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. A box. A box of plant. I should have put the word tree there more than plant. A box of tree can be moved around, but it will stop its growth. I could put a tree in a box because I want to move it to another place. But if I don't take that tree out of that box, that tree will not grow anymore. The tree will only grow based upon the space you give it. That's how it ha that's just part of life. Amen? You know what we do sometimes? Sometimes we box ourselves up and we wonder why we're not growing. Why are we not growing? Hey, we're boxing ourselves up. You got to box, you got to unbox yourself. You got to unbox. You know, people say, well, you know, you're putting God in a box. You can't put God in a box. You can't put God in a box if you try. You know, when people, when you, when you hear that, oh, they're putting God in the box, you're saying that God is a creature, the, the, the creature, and that you're the creator. No, it's the opposite. God is never in the box. We're in the box. We box ourselves in and not realize that we're the problem. And we have no fruits. Because, you know, if you keep a tree in a box, it will not bear fruit. And to you, it has a chance to spread out. You know those trees that you see in the, um, in the nurseries? They're small like this, and they have a bunch of fruits on it. You ever try to take one of those fruit trees home? You buy, you put it, you know, in the land, or you put it in a, in a small hole. Notice that tree eventually dies. I've done, I, I done that mistake. It dies. Or no more fruits take place. And it's very simple why. You ready for this? 
Whether you know it or not, that tree that you just bought from that nursery was being watered every single day. And if you don't keep that up, that tree cannot grow anymore. You got to do the same thing now. If you want it to grow at that rate. If you're watered by the Holy Spirit every day, you're going to have fruit whether you like it or not. It's going to grow out of you whether you like it or not. You will not be able to control it because it, you're being watered every single day. And God is trying to simply show us, get yourself out of the box. Abide in Him. Notice that He never say, I will abide in you so you could abide in me. It says, you abide in me, and I will abide in you. God is not going to force himself in you. He waits for you to make the move. He already made the move at the cross. At the cross, Jesus made all the move that needed to be made. Now it's up to us to say, I want to abide in you, Lord. With that perspective of understanding, I want to abide in you because I know with you, I will bear fruits for your glory and for your honor, Lord. And guess what? All he's waiting is for us to abide in him. And then he will abide in us and we'll be able to get the fruits that we need to give out. Resurrection Sunday is around the corner. Two more Sundays. The Sunday that most people, the two Sunday, the two top Sundays of the whole year is resurrection and Christmas, resurrection being number one. People will go to church just to go. Remember, for the past, as Will said earlier, the past uh, two to three months, we've been praying for people specifically, praying for them, believing for them to get saved. I just got a call yesterday from one of my, uh, uh, one, I won't even give details, to someone I've been praying for for those two months straight without stopping every single day. And to my shock and surprise, this person started talking about God. I was like, wow. I'm like, if I'm talking to the same person, this person that really was like anti-God in a certain degree, he's telling me the goodness of God. He's telling me how God has kept him alive when he should have been dead. He's, he's, telling, he's telling me these things. He's telling me that he thinks that God has a plan for him, maybe. Listen, if you do not believe in prayers, then you don't know what you're talking about. Prayers changes everything. And it might take years for something to change, but prayers are the only thing that could actually change someone's heart. You're here because someone prayed for you. You're here because someone believed for you. And you might never know who that person was, but you're here because someone took the time to believe God for your soul. Folks, we need to take the time and effort of connecting with those people that we've been praying for for the past couple of months or so. We need to make the time now of saying, I'm going to start inviting these people. I want to believe for them because I pray for them already. I want to start believing that God is going to do something for them. Folks, isn't it worth it that even only one person shows up for Resurrection Day and gets saved of your circle of influence? Would that not be worth it? I think it would, in all honesty. Don't look at, well, I don't think I'm going to get all 100 of the people that I'm praying for, or 500. Maybe some of you have 500 people you've been praying for. Maybe some of you only have 10 people you've been praying for. The number doesn't make a difference. Key is you invite and let them make their free choice by saying, yes, I'm going to go. But our prayers is, Lord, open their eyes. Take the blinders of their eyes so they could see and accept the truth. We have an opportunity for people to get saved on Resurrection Sunday. We have an opportunity. Let's not allow that opportunity to pass us because of our doubts, our fears, because we're like, well, you know, I'm not sure. Listen. Everyone received a text this morning that was sent already? I'm sorry. Everyone received an email that Will talked about earlier of that an invite card that Nicole made. You all got it already. All you have to do is just take that invite, save it to your photo stream, and you know what? Every time you're going to text someone, pick that picture, 
invite, send it to someone, and pray. God, I send it to this person. I pray that they're going to accept. Maybe this phone number is, oh, rephrase, let me rephrase that. Maybe there's people that you don't have their information that you could send that invite. But guess what? We have a whole bunch of little square cards out there that says IOC, right? Take, take some with you. And those people who do not have, you, do, you don't have their information, give them that card. That invite is being put on the web page. That invite is to invite people, to, to let them know. Because here's the thing about it. You're praying what the Bible says. No one comes to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. You're praying, Holy Spirit, draw them to you. Take the blinders off their eyes. Holy Spirit, I'm praying that you're going to have your way. And let the Holy Spirit have his way. But he needs your collaboration of you sending the information so he can move on them. You'd be surprised how one card, one invite might be the one thing that opens their eyes. Might be that one thing that opens their heart to want to hear the gospel. Amen? All right, folks. Key takeaway. Short phrase, quickly. Come on. Say the first word. Weed. We must... No fruits, it's because no Holy Spirit. Amen? Holy Spirit, daily, not once a, maybe once a week is okay. Daily. Every day, seeking God so we could bear fruit. If you confine yourself to a box and expect to grow, guess you know what that's called, right? Anyone can tell me? Insanity. That's what that means. You're, you're doing something, but you expect growth out of it. No, it don't work that way. If you're not doing nothing, you get nothing. I know someone the other day said something about where we're going. I don't know, nowhere. I go, then that's exactly where we're going, nowhere. We're going nowhere. You said it, right? You just said it, nowhere. Unless someone makes a decision, we're going here. We're going, we're going to be right here like this. That's all we're going to be doing. And that's what we do as Christians sometimes. We go nowhere because we're indecisive. That's why we go nowhere. One more person. Come on, the anointing come on this side. <laughs> study, not just read. Study the word so that you could know the difference between the social gospel and God's gospel. And that's what it takes. The word, the word, the word is what teaches us, is what shows us. And those all watching online, Listen, it's like all of us here. Let's all stand. We're here by the grace of the Almighty God is why we're here. We're here because God has us here. But we're here because we chose to say God. We chose, to, we choose, we choose, wait, chose, choose, choose, chose, choose, choose. We chose to say, God, I'm here. I'm here. You gave me the opportunity. I'm taking that opportunity. God, can you show me? God, can you reveal to me? God, can you open my eyes? Can you open my heart? Can you open my ears? Can you open my understanding for me to know more of who you really are? Anyone you love, you work harder to find out more about that person. If you say you love God, but you do nothing about it, then your love is a social love. Is not truly a God love. Because anything that comes from the heart searches, desires, wants it. Amen? We love God because he loved us first. And thank God we accepted his love. Thank God we accepted his way, not our way. His way. And maybe you're going through some hard times right now, but I want you to realize that it, unless you do something, nothing's going to ever change. Sitting, doing nothing changes nothing. It's doing, finding out, exploring the Word of God, studying the Word of God, finding out who He really is, understanding who He is. If you're tired of the same problems over and over and over again, you're wondering why this thing don't change. Listen, you need to connect to a community. You need to connect to a church. 
A church is important because we have each other to help each other, to pray for each other, to encourage each other. You can't be isolated and think you're going to grow. It doesn't work that way. You grow when, other, when you're with other people because you get challenged. That's why. And those challenges is what makes you grow. You don't want just a head knowledge like a social gospel. You want a knowledge that comes through experience. And that is an experience with our Father, an experience with our Savior, an experience with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis so we could have the fruits that He's calling us to have. Father, we pray for those who are watching now, Father God, that, Lord, whatever they're going through, we pray, Father God, that they'll press in more to you and less to the world, more to you and less to self. They'll press in more in seeking you, Lord God, because only you could bring a peace upon their life that they need. Only you could bring a solution to their situation. We pray for those who are sick, for those who are hurting physically, that you bring healing to their bodies even now. Father, you said by the stripes that are upon the back of Jesus Christ that we were made healed. We take that word and we stand on the word, Father God. We believe in that word for healing to take place. Even now, Father, we pray for, for those here. If you're sick and you're here today and you're going through something, come to the front. We're going to pray for you. And I want to let those who are watching right now, thank you for joining us. Connect with us at ioc.live. We want to pray for you. And more personal, but we got to find out by you calling us or emailing us for us to know what's going on. And thank you for joining us. And Lord, I want to pray right now also for Jen, Father God, who sent a text earlier that she's going through physical heart problems in her life right now, Father God, and her body better set. Lord, we pray for deliverance and a total healing in her body, Father God, that you touch her where she's at. We come in agreement as a church for her right now, Father God, that you send that word where she is at right now in Kansas. We touch her in Jesus' mighty name. We all say amen. Thank you for joining us. Those who are watching us, God bless you. Those who are here right now, I just want you to just worship God right now. Just worship him. He is holy. He's so holy. We need to look and see him for who he really is.